And we have with us today um, Dr. Florence Anoro, who is a plant and environmental um, biologist and also our uh, in-house industrial hemp specialist. And we also have with us uh, Jason Ergel, who is a managing member of Hemp Grid. Now, before these two um, begin their presentation, I just want to give you a few housekeeping rules. Um, first, of course, we ask that you keep your device on mute um, throughout the program so as not to distract um, others from the presentation. And then we will gladly take your questions. Um, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box here and towards the end of the uh, presentation, we will address your questions. Uh, um, and then of course, I know often we get asked whether or not we will provide um, the presentations at the end of, of the, um, the webinar. And the answer to that is yes, we will provide the presentation decks. Um, we will email them to, to the email addresses that you use to register for this event. So I will not hold you any longer. I'm pleased to introduce you or bring up, bring on board uh, Mr. Jason Ergel. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nuro. Thank you uh, all of SC State for having me. Uh, I'm honored to share some of the knowledge uh, gained uh, from uh, four or five years in industrial hemp industry. Let me get my slide deck pulled up. Okay, can you guys see the my slide deck? Can you guys see my slide deck? Okay. Yes, yes, it is. they can see it. Okay, great. All right, so this is session three, and we have sort of gone through the life cycle in the, in the previous sessions of of preparation of land, genetic selection planting, cultivation, harvesting, drying, and curing. Um, so at, we've got this point where I'm going to cover uh, a little bit about cannabinoid processing um, at a high level, uh, talk a little bit about um, some sort of new uh, updates in federal and state regulations and some gray areas there, and then also go into the economics uh, around hemp and look at some items and cost elements that we need to account for um, in our cost of production models. So first, we'll start with um, cannabinoid processing methods. There's multiple ways to process, um, you know, cannabinoids out of the hemp plant. I'm going to cover sort of four of the most popular out there. And this has been done for, you know, some of these methods have been done for thousands of years, you know, to process uh, essential oils and other types of plants. The first one I'm going to cover is extraction by solvent. Um, this method, you, you take uh, ethanol or hydrocarbon such as butane or propane and you mix it and wash it over, um, you know, the, the hemp flower, the hemp biomass, it pulls out the desirable compounds, uh, CBD, CBG, et cetera. Um, it's, um, you know, it's got some pros, it's got some cons, like all these methods do. Pros are it's, um, it's scalable, it's, uh, it's efficient, the equipment is fairly inexpensive, um, and it doesn't require, uh, require quite as much specialized equipment. Uh, the cons are, when you finish um, with extraction by solvent, you don't have a, a purely full refined oil. Um, there can be some remaining solvent, uh, res remaining solvent, so it takes some time and maybe another couple more processes to get it to a refined oil um, through distillation, winterization, et cetera. Um, also, propane and butane can be flammable, so you need to have trained individuals working with these flammable solvents um, to you know, keep it safe as possible. I'm gonna show you a little diagram on each. Uh, method as well. This is um, this is solvent extraction. If you go from right to left here, you see where you know the hemp comes in. It's added with alcohol and oils, put through the cold water condenser, hot water out, extracted oil in to the far left there. And again, you can look at these diagrams and then do some more research on your own online um, to go specifically into each of these steps. The next type of extraction on um, that is very common in the industry is CO2 extraction. CO2, as we all know, is carbon dioxide. It's used to pull the cannabinoids and other desirable compounds out of the harvested hemp. 
it is extremely pre precise. It's solvent free. And so a lot of, a lot of people in the industry like this uh, extraction method because you get a pure product after the process is complete. Um, it's environmentally friendly as it doesn't use as much energy. Um, however, this is a, a, a more scientific, um, complicated process and requires more complicated and expensive equipment. So not quite as scalable as, as ethanol or you know, hydrocarbon extraction. Show you a little um, diagram of supercritical uh, CO2 extraction. There's, there's low, medium, and supercritical CO2 extraction. That's basically different levels of uh, the purity um, with the levels of temperature that you're using. Um, here you'll see the, the diagram that, that flows in a circle here. And again, each of these steps has multiple types of equipment, multiple brand names to, to purchase, as well as multiple uh, more details online that you can research on each step. The uh, third type of extraction slash distillation, it's, it's common. Um, you see a lot of this when folks are extracting essential oils, you know, lavender and lemongrass and things like that. So it's been used for a long time. It, uh, you basically use steam uh, to extract the raw plant material um, into the you know, desirable compound, cool it, that cooling process um, condenses it down, um, and then the water is separated out. Um, pros of this, it's inexpensive, straightforward, solvent-free. Um, the cons are it does require more, more plant material, so you have less efficiency. You know, your cost per uh, input is going to be higher on this to get your final end product. Um, and then that last sentence at the bottom on cons is, you know, you have to be careful um, to keep, you know, the, the purity of the chemical properties of some of the, the heat signatures of the cannabinoids and compounds within the plant. So you get a diagram of the steam. This is going from, you know, left to right here got the hemp in your in your container you add steam to it it vaporizes the the waxes and the oils you run it through cold water condenses hot water um, comes through then you basically separate the oil and the residual water out like i said this has been done for thousands of years uh, for all different types of plants the last one i'm going to cover is um it's more i would say like i would say a home method um folks that are kind of doing it you know small batch at their house. This is something that you can, uh, you can do, um, you know, on your stove top. So if you're growing a small amount and you want to do some simplified, um, extraction, olive oil extraction is one way to do it. Um, you're basically adding the oil, olive oil into it, your, you know, your CBD, CBG or other cannabis compound cannabinoid mixture. Um, the olive oil and the, um, and the hydrocarbon salt, uh, hydrocarbon solvents separate out um, so you don't have as much uh, residual solvents um, it's inexpensive you can do it at your house um, it's got more safety um, if anybody's cooked like a roast and put it in your refrigerator and you see how the uh, you know when you've got the refrigerator for a while you see those oils and whatnot that separation is what we're going to look at next which is winterization so everybody's kind of winterized something before and that's a that's a method to uh, make a, a more pure product and a product with more shelf life. Here's a quick little diagram on olive oil uh, CBD extraction. So you can see it's you know hot. Put your hemp in. Put your olive oil in. It's infused. You add heat to it. Basically, uh, have that heat on there for a while, and it becomes a blended oil. Um, so you don't really have a, an extracted or a Uh, I mentioned winterization. So when you have these processes I've, I mentioned before, um, there's other steps in the process to refine uh, the crude oil. Winterization is a process, like I just mentioned, when it comes to um, removing the fats and lipids, um, the waxes, chlorophylls out of, of the hemp material, um, which obviously increases shelf life. And, and again, the example I give is you put you know, some meat in a refrigerator after you've cooked it, when it gets cold after a while, you take it back out, you see that there's that layer of fat, you know, on top of the, of the meat. Same, same kind of concept. Um, winterization, again, is create more refined, pure, as well as create more shelf life for your product.
here's a, I've got two, two quick slides on just showing the steps of winterization. Um, you basically have your crude oil, you have ethanol, it mixes into the, the, the micella on the right there, which is a basically a mixture of the, the crude oil and hemp material as well as the fats, lipids, waxes, and chlorophyll. They separate out, um, add the ethanol. And then this next, uh, next couple steps takes it through to pull the um, micella out and separate the separated fats, lipids, waxes, and chlorophyll. You see it goes through a pump and through filter plates to get it to that point. Again, all different types of brand equipment for all of these steps that you can go in and research on your own. Um, and if you have any questions at the end, I'd be happy to ask or answer whatever you have. Here's a quick picture um, I got from Catna Systems that shows you some of the you know, large equipment for types of extraction. Um, again, these, there's a big range in prices and, and um, specifications that you can get depending on what type of extraction method you're going to use. They all have advantages. They all have pros and cons. So you have to find out what's right for your farm, for your operation, and, uh, and go from there. Uh, the last little step I wanted to mention is, is terpenes. Um, terpenes are, um, are compounds that exist in so many plants. When you, you know, smell an orange or lemon, those are terpenes that smell inside of those plants, inside of those fruits. Um, cannabis has them as well. When you extract and distill uh, cannabis oil, a lot of times you lose some of that flavor and aroma that uh, limonene, uh, pinene, or, or rhinolul um, creates from those floral, citrus, and pine flavors. So a lot of um, uh, operators will add the, the terpenes back at the end. You can buy them separately. Um, they, they've got a few different advantages to having full control over the flavor and aroma. Um, a lot of folks like the entourage effects with the terpenes working with the cannabinoids in order to um, help a, a more uh, sustainable and complete, um, you know, medicinal application. And then also it can comp complement certain cannabis strains <laughs> for desired purposes. Um, so more details on that online as well. Um, that's, that's all basically a high level view of different types of extraction, distillation methods, winterization of cannabinoid processing. I know that uh, Dr. Neuro is gonna cover some, some fiber processing in a little bit. For that, I wanted to go through, I know we've talked about state rules and regs already um, with, with uh, part of ag coming in and doing a webinar and myself and Dr. Neuro. But there's some new updates in the industry that I just wanted to make sure folks were aware of um, just to be careful of and, and to keep an eye on. Um, real quick, this is the um, this is the slide just showing what made hemp, industrial hemp, federally legal. It's the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018, otherwise known as the Federal Farm Bill. In addition to that, the U.S. Domestic Hemp Production Program was a set of guidelines and regulatory oversight for each state who's, who's participating in the um, 2018 Farm Bill um, you know, legalization there on what their rules and regs are. And those state rules and regs have to be approved at the USDA federal level. Um, so here's a few bullet points on how that works. Um, we've, we've covered some of this before, but with these federal rules, we've, um, we've, we've kind of run in some gray area on some of these compounds and cannabinoids um, that we wanna make sure everybody's aware of. We've all heard of Delta 9 THC, which is what the Farm Bill designated as the um, cannabinoid that determines the concentration that determines whether it is hemp or marijuana, 0.3% THC and below is considered industrial and hemp, um, 0.3 and above is considered marijuana. There's obviously some bills going through to try to help change that, but for now, that's what we're dealing with. However, because of this, I believe some of you probably have, have heard about and, and or seen in retail shops, uh, Delta 8 and more recently Delta 10 THC. These are cannabinoids that do exist in the plant in small amounts. However, they are being um, produced from CBD derivatives. Um, so made from CBD derivatives into a isomer of uh, Delta 9. Um, uh, some of those you know, concentrations can have psychoactive effects, but because it's coming from a CBD derivative, um, there's some gray area between the, the federal government and some of the state governments on whether these are legal or not. So I advise anyone that's looking into Delta 8 or Delta 10 um, here in South Carolina, make sure you, you know, consult with you know, your attorney or the rules and regs. Um, there's been got a couple of headlines here 
Um, there's been some, you know, some seizures um, and some confusion um, going on. This is the first article up here. Headline is from the Post and Courier here in Charleston um, with a Lexington vape shop. Um, got some of their Delta 8 cartridges uh, confiscated, as well as one down up in the upstate. So I wanted to just address that real quick um, so everybody was aware. And a little note there that uh, currently we have 11 states that actually effectively banned Delta 8. Um, so far in, in South Carolina, we have not done that, but there is gray area, so make sure you be, you're careful with that. The last uh, topic I'm discussing today is the economics of hemp. Um, we discussed a little bit last time about the marketplace and you know how to find buyers and things like that. Today, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the cost of production and how you know you can accurately account for the cost elements um, as well as revenue cycles that will give you your return on investment. And I've used an example here. It's just an example. Um, it helps take you through all the different things you need to be thinking about when you decide to, to grow hemp, to process hemp, and to sell hemp. So uh, I'll start here. This, is a, this model is on 10 acres. Um, again, it's just an example. Um, these numbers are not you know, definite. And as we all know, um, prices and costs change frequently. So the fluctuation, you need to make sure that you, know, you do this every year as an update um, to find out what your, your fertilization is going to cost, your soil tests are going to cost. Um, so looking at this 10-acre model, um, I'm starting out here with the fixed costs. So that's obviously your machinery, your irrigation, your dry materials, your rental for your land. Um, those are things that are fixed no matter how much you grow. The operational cost, uh, some of the cost elements there that you need to take into account are, you know, soil testing, cost of your transplants or your seeds or your clones, whatever genetic you're going to use. Want to make sure that you're taking into account the fertilization and fertigation costs. Weed control um, can be a big cost depending on whether you're going to use plastic or you're going to use, you know, hand labor or machine uh, machinery to cultivate. Um, again, the irrigation um, can be a you know, operational costs as well as fixed um, based on how much water you may need to pump in. Um, then the operational cost of machinery, you know, fixing, you know, repairs, new tires, things like that, um, or operational costs that can occur per season. Um, labor also, as you see there, is a big cost. Um, trying to accurately estimate labor, very important in order to find out, you know, what your total cost um, inputs are going to be so you can figure out what your return on investment is going to be. Here's some non-operational costs I wanted to go over. Um, you said a high level, so you're aware that you do account for these. Uh, suppliers, um, you know, transportation of any of your materials, either your genetics from the transportation, uh, the genetic supplier to your, your farm, um, or for your harvested material to a, a processor, et cetera. Licensing fees, you know, depending on what you're, you're doing, um, we have different uh, size licensing fees in South Carolina, you know, cultivation license is a thousand. I think the processing license is around 3000. Um, you, you have testing that you have to complete in order to be compliant with the federal and state programs, um, inspection fees, security, um, and then interest bank interest if you're using loans and obviously a little catch all other. So this is again, just an example showing that um, in this example, 10 acres, it's about $151, $152,000 with uh, about, that's about $15,000 per, per acre um, in cost. So now we can look at the revenue side. Again, I can take some questions about this at the end. Um, if you look at the bottom there of this slide, you can see the main assumptions that I've put in there. Again, you need to make sure that you're updating this annually or even quarterly. Um, because these prices and costs change frequently. Um, if, if we have 1,500 plants per acre with 1,400 pounds per acre um, in sales, meaning means sales are 14,250 pounds, these are the revenues and the costs that we would um, generate. And therefore, in this example, again, just an example, on 10 acres, there would be a return before taxes um, of $154,000. So these are some cost elements. There could be more. Every you know farm and every operation is a little bit different. You may have additional costs. I have it listed here. Um, you know, such as you know your greenhouse operation or your buildings, things like that that you need to account for. Um, but this is a I think a lion's share of a lot of the cost elements you need to take into account. Got a few graphs here just to show you from this example. You can see um, uh, there's three different scenarios here, experienced 
grower um, in the, on the far left with a produced under plastic grower and then a hemp seed grower. So you're seeing the green is the revenues, the orange is the cost. So you're kind of seeing where your cost and, uh, and revenue ratio is, is in these different types of products. This is from 2020. So obviously, you know, you need to look at, um, you know, hemp benchmarks is a great place I mentioned last time to look at cost and prices currently in the industry. They update it frequently. I showed this slide last time. We wanted to show it again, just since we were dealing with prices. And um, you'll see here that um, different types of the um, products, whether it's CBD biomass, CBD flour, uh, isolate oils, seed, um, you can track to see where those prices have gone um, from October 19 to October 20. And obviously we'll have some, you know, there'll be some new updated um, data there if you um, register for hemp benchmarks. Uh, another another quick graph I showed last time showing you that the flower was last year um, something that really um, you know was on the on the positive side of a return investment so a lot of folks went in that direction um, around the country last year um, just some resources obviously SC State um, please you know contact the key personnel there for any questions you have um, they're doing a great job of of you know, getting feet first in the industry and doing a lot of, of research and interaction with the community. Um, so very happy and honored to be a part of, of their education process here. Um, they've got some key personnel I um, want to go through real quick. Dr. Norell, you're going to hear from her in, in a few moments. Dr. Joshua Adasi, um, he's a state program leader in sustainable agriculture. Eddie Adjibajan, uh, Associate Extension Administrator. Dr. Lewis Whitesides, the Vice President Executive Director um, of the program um, of 1890 grants and extension. And Dr. Lamine Drama, um, direct, Director of Strategic in Initiatives. Um, a little bit about Hemp Grid before I let you go. I think some of you guys might have seen this last time. Um, we're a end-to-end uh, -end supply chain innovation optimization company. Um, this, this chart here shows the supply chain from cultivation all the way to finished goods and the retail. Um, we try to help uh, complete and optimize each of these steps in the supply chain so that we can create uh, you know, better linkage between the you know, suppliers, the end users, and, and help bring a more, um, you know, good standard products to the consumer um, in all different aspects of the, of the supply chain. Um, we basically focus on three verticals, um, health and wellness, natural fiber composites that we're gonna see a lot more of going forward, like, you know, in BMW, you know, puts the, the fiber in their car doors and the paneling, and as well as the environmental, where we're going um, into remediation carbon sequestration, et cetera. And we do make sure that we try to implement digital innovation around all three of these verticals. Here's some of our business services um, in, in finance, sustainability, sales and marketing. We can help you find labor, um, your supplier network, um, and then all of these, these items on the left and right, needs analyses, um, valuation and exit um, analysis. So, um, this wheel, you can come back to it. And if you need help with any of these, these items, you know, give us a call. This is the eye chart on purpose uh, to show you all of the different industries and companies that the industrial hemp um, industry touches. Um, so we'll see how, whether it's packaging or whether it's, you know, composite material. See a lot of these industries get touched and we're trying to help um, lessen that, you know, that supply chain, you know, you know, complications. Again, my name is Jason Nurgle uh, from Hemp Grid. And I really appreciate your time. And after Dr. Nero's presentation, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. We really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Anuro, you're up next. Um, so um, as you saw from Jason Ergo's presentation, he covers um, a lot of basis on economics and processing of uh, CBD um, biomass using different methods, the, the high end and the, uh, the cheap end of that. And for my portion, I'm going to um, talk about first, I'm going to talk about cover crops uh, because one of the um, 
things that we lay and we make emphasis on in hemp cultivation and in agriculture in general is sustainable agricultural practices. Uh, sometimes they call it uh, good agricultural agricultural practices gap, and the tenet of that good agricultural practice is making sure that you are uh, doing things in a way that you were not destroying the soil, uh, but rather you are regenerating the soil and making sure that soil health is at the forefront of anything that you do in terms of farm farming. So cover crops is one way to incorporate a lot of good agricultural practices. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a picture that I inserted here. Um, the field that you see in this in this picture is a field um, with cover crops of different kinds, mostly winter cover crops. And this was on a um, a farm that had harvested industrial hemp the year before. And during the winter, this cover crop was planted there. Uh, and this is in, in Bowman, South Carolina, actually um, one of our partnering uh, farmers. Um, and here you see that there's a mixture of cover crops. And what it does is that while your land is fallow between cultivations, this cover crops is doing great work trying to put back nutrients into the soil. Uh, it increases biodiversity, both um, soil, microorganisms, um, and also um, pollinators. So there's a lot of good things that come with from the cover crop. And as I go through my presentation, you will see the different types of cover crops um, and they each group or individual cover crop has a specific thing that it does to uh, the soil. But the general consensus, the general um, point is that the use of cover crops allows you to minimize um, pesticide use. Uh, it allows you to minimize um, fertilizer use, especially if you do it right. And selecting the right cover crops, time to uh, planting it, um, those are very, very important. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide is just a, um, let me put this in, excuse me. So this slide shows the, uh, a brief overview of our 1890 um, research goal and our objectives. Can you make that bigger, Morris? Can you hear me? Okay, that's all right. But here, I I put it here just to remind um, folks and people about what where uh, our goal is. Um, our major goal is to establish a sustainable slash integrated industrial hemp research program. And the integration is in, you know, looking at the research aspect, look at an extension and education, because both three um, parts of this, of this goal are very important for us to move forward. And then of course the objectives here, and I, I've showed this in the previous um, representations that we, we, we did in, previ in, in previous webinars, uh, we are doing conducting research on both indoor and outdoor, um, looking at different varieties. And again, the goal is to collect as much data as possible so that farmers would have um, informed knowledge of what they, uh, the, the varieties there um, they'll be selecting for both the CBD and the fiber um, varieties. Uh, we are also collaborating with a lot of um, hemp farmers um, in our quest to uh, do this uh, integrated research, and that includes processors, um, those who are lining up to become processors and current processors. We are collaborating with all of them to make sure that those who are actually in the hemp business cultivation, um, whether it's fiber or CBD, have a place to take their, their biomass at the end um, for processing, because that's one of the biggest um, a problem that farmers have. Where do I take my crop when at the end of the season when I ha when I harvest it? And then of course we also have um, networking opportunities for our farmers through of course this webinar um, and also organizations that are centered on improving the farming cultivation of industrial hemp processing 
and also products that individual farmers can get into um, to maximize their economic opportunity. And then, of course, future plan here is the establish, establishing of the uh, testing facilities uh, for CBD, as I mentioned earlier, and for fiber and grain. Next slide, please. All right, so why do we, why is cover crop uh, important? Uh, um, again, good agricultural practices, um, USDA, NRCS, um, those organizations are very uh, focused on getting farmers to do things right. Um, the climate is changing, we know that. Um, the soils are depleted because a lot of times you farm on the same land over and over again. The use of fertilizers and, and, and pesticides also create a huge environmental issue for the farmers themselves and then for the environment. It goes into our water system, it, uh, some of them are airborne, and it creates um, health issues. And we know that minorities are dispropor dispropor disproportionately affected by these health issues. So growing your crop in a way that it minimizes your exposure to these toxic chemicals and also healing your land. You know, the, the old folks who say heal your land, healing your land. One way to do that is by using of cover crops. So here we're going to look at why cover crops, why is it important? How do you select the best cover crop for different uses? Uh, during the winter, during the spring, and or, or even summer. What are the application methods? And how do you incorporate your cover crop into the soil? Um, once you plant it, what do you do with it? How long do you leave, leave it for? Those are important things that farmers need to have a knowledge of. Next slide, please. And at the end, I'll take a lot of questions um, concerning this because I don't want to give a long talk. So I would answer questions as, um, at the end, anything that is not um, covered here. All right, so the first thing here is why cover crop? So the, we begin by defining or telling what cover crop is. So any crop that is planted for the sole purpose of, of improving or holding soil in place is called a cover crop. Now, the definition varies from person to person. Some people will, will call it, you know, give it different definition. But in general, that's the definition of cover crop. Cover crops have different types of uses. Um, people plant cover crops for forage. If you have um, animals on your farm, you can actually you cover, um, plant cover crops and your animals can forage on it. That's good agricultural practice. Um, cover crop, as I mentioned, uh, if you're not using it for forage, it, it's good for bringing pollinators to your farm. Biodiversity is very essential to our environment. And of course, the carbon um, sequestration. As you finish harvesting your industrial hemp or any other crop, by the way, whether you're into green leafy, uh, leafy greens or any other type of crop, once you harvest your, your, your plants, a lot of times the land is sitting there and the carbon, the carbon that the plants were sequestering while they were growing, they're no longer performing that function. When you replace the land that have been harvested with cover crops, now there is a constant sequestration of carbon. And that is one way to um, alleviate some of the climate um, change issues that we have. And you know, carbon, um, a carbon release is one of the um, one of the corporates in, in the climate change uh, in addition to other things. And so the other thing is that cover crops are excellent, not only for holding the soil, but it can actually loosen the soil. If you go to some parts, parts of South Carolina, the soil is very compact. Even after you till your soil, they end up in clumps. And those clumps means that the, when you plant something into that soil, there's the, the aeration, which means the movement of air and water is not um, good. Your plant needs a soil that is loose enough that when you water, there is good drainage system, drainage system and also airflow into the soil. So cover crops, certain cover crops help to loosen compact soil and make your plants grow better. 
and it helps them also retain nutrient better. Uh, please go back for a minute quickly. Go back to, all right, there, okay. Um, the next cover crops that I'm talking about is also the, what, the cover crops that are called nitrogen fixing cover crops. Now, for a lot of people, this may sound fancy. Nitrogen fixing basically means that these crops are able to fix, basically change nitrogen from its atmospheric form to the form that plants can use it. Our air, if you sample our air today, there's a lot of uh, nitrogen in the air, about 79% nitrogen. Plants cannot use atmospheric nitrogen in that form. It needs to be changed into nitrate or nitrate-like um, form in order for them to use it. Fortunately, some plants, the legumes, have this capacity, this natural capacity to actually change nitrogen, atmos atmospheric nitrogen into nitrate and make it available for plants. Basically, they are furnishing plants, the plants with the nutrient that it's not readily available. And that eliminates the use of uh, high nitrogen fertilizers. And you know, if you're a farmer, nitrogen pollution, it's a big issue uh, in, in farm and agricultural practice today. Next, next slide. So this is just a, a schematic diagram of how this works. And I'm not going to go into too much details. This is what I, I kind of teach in my botany class for my students on plant physiology. But just to give you an idea, this is a plant here. Uh, of course, this is a bean plant, a legume, but a different types of legume. And the next few slides will actually show you the list of cover crops that are uh, grouped under the legume family. And these crops are, when you plant them, they're busy on the ground doing marvelous things for your soil. They actually form nodules or little bumps in their root system. And I don't know if you can see it in those in those in their root system on the ground those nodules are where the bacteria form this symbiotic relationship with the roots so the roots allow this bacteria to come and make contact and they they actually invade the roots but this is a good form of invasion when they get into the roots they now stay in there and they change the atmospheric nitrogen that plants cannot use and turn it into nitrate and plants can now absorb the, nitri the nitrate without you fertilizing your soil with nitrogen. The plant in, in turn then, then gives the bacteria, it furnishes a place for them to, to live and it gives them their amino acids and, and carbohydrates. So the bacteria is happy doing the work and the plant, is the plant is happy. So this is why cover crops, especially the nitrogen fixing groups are also very good for good agricultural practice. Next slide. So cover crops I've mentioned, if you're keeping track, um, not only do they heal your soil in general, but specific ways, they add ag organic matter. So as your cover crop is it's growing, it has to be harvested in some, uh, sometimes, depending on what it is that you're growing. Uh, if, it's a, if it's an economic uh, important crop, agricultural crop, you can actually harvest some of that and then incorporate the rest of it into your soil. Basically, you till it back into your soil. But there's, there's always, um, it, it's always important to know when to stop your cover crops from growing. If it's, if it's cover crop that has economic importance, say wheat or oat or rye, you can harvest your, the grains from, this, from these cover crops and then till the, uh, the biomass back into the soil and then they decompose and become organic matter. And on, your, on the right here, on the right side of my screen, uh, it's just a good soil that has a lot of organic matter. And that's what you want in your soil. And if a plant can do this, or a group of plants can do this, why not use it? And so, um, so in addition to this, these plants also attract um, good insects, uh, beneficial insects. That include butterflies, bees. So with one swoop of seeds in your farm, you can have all these advantages. And of course, these insects have a special function for your crops. They are pollinators, and they also help to actually um, get rid of some, um, some insects, aphids, and, and other things that, um, 
may be plaguing your, your, your farm. Next slide, please. All right, so here, um, Morris, can you, can you click on the, on the, on the slide, there's an icon that expands this on yours. I don't know if you can do that so that this chart can be a little bigger. Can you, can you click on the slideshow icon on the bottom of the, if you click on slideshow, it should be bigger. No? Okay, that's fine. Um, but here is a chart of different cover crops. Um, okay, let me see, maybe I can do this. Okay, all right, so, oops. Okay, I'm trying to zoom in on it so you can see what is here. So this chart here shows you different groups of cover crops. And again, let me emphasize, cover crops are not only good for industrial hemp, um, cultivation, you can use it for any type of um, cropping system that you have. Okay, so here, this chart groups the plants into different um, groups. The first group here are the legumes. The legumes are the nitrogen fixing group. That includes beans, um, there's hairy velch. M many of, some of you may already have know this plant, but for those who don't know, uh, alfalfa, um, common velch, Australian field pea, crimson clover, uh, mammoth red clover. These are all different types of nitrogen fixing cover crops that you can use and they heal and enrich your soil. In addition to adding organic matter once you till them into the, the soil, okay? Now, the next group are the brassicas. These are also called sometimes the mustard family. Um, that includes radish, turnips, um, and, and, and of course, mustard. One of the good things about this group is that because uh, they have deep rooting system, they are the ones that can help loosen your soil because of their, their deep rooting system, they can loosen your soil and aerate your soil. So when you have uh, water and when you're feeding your soil, if you're incorporating any type of compost and it rains, uh, there's good drainage and they, the plants retain um, the, the nutrients better and they do better. The next group, Okay, the next group is, let me go back in. Okay, so the next group uh, are the cereal grains and grasses. Now, if you look here, uh, these are, you have your annual rye, your winter rye, your winter barley, your winter um, um, tree cat, your winter wheat, oats, and buckwheat. All of these are what we call the, in the nutrition industry, these are what they call the multigrain um, that they now want everyone to use um, in either bread or other types of um, um, products. So you can actually grow this cover crops and make money off them. But again, you have to choose, make sure that you're choosing the ones that do well in the winter versus spring or summer. These cover crops, you can plant while your industrial hemp is growing, you can actually plant them in between your rows and that keeps the, the weed at bay so you don't have to worry too much of, uh, the, of, of weeding. You might have some, you still have some weed, but you will not have the same type of weed problem you have if you didn't have them. And then once you harvest your, um, your industrial hemp, these cover crops can then be planted in your fallow land and it keeps the, the uh, carbon sequestration and it keeps all of this healing of the soil going until your next planting time. All right, next slide. Okay, so I have here, these are called the simple rules about um, regarding when to plant. So what you need to know and what you need to decide is how much space do you have? And if you look at the list of cover crops that I showed in the previous slide, 
each cover crop has a specific number of seeds or uh, pounds per acre. So you look at your acreage and then you decide which group of those cover crops that you want to um, use in your farm. You can, you can plant single cover crops or a mixture of two, but in most cases, a mixture of two or three is even better because you're getting multiple um, uh, benefits from, from them, okay? So here again, for soil compaction problem, I have grouped them into, these are the ones that you can use, um, radish, turnips, clovers. For nitrogen fixation, you have the summer alfalfa, clovers, and clovers have um, different types, and then your field peas. These are the things you can use for to uh, put back nitrogen in your soil, especially if it's a soil that you've planted over and over um, again, uh, this helps to um, replenish it with nitrogen. If you're planting something like corn, and, and this is away from um, industrial hemp now, these things will actually help to replenish your soil as well. Then for the winter, you also have these groups for your winter cover crops. And these are the ones you will typically plant uh, if you're following the good agricultural practice. And once you have it, your, your industrial hemp, sometime in October, depending on when you start your, your industrial hemp cultivation, uh, some people will start early October, some will start mid-October, but at late as November, that's when you plant your cover, your winter cover crops, and they will start to grow. And until uh, um, springtime, when it is time for you again to plant your, your industrial hemp, you will now decide when to terminate because you have to terminate it in time before they go to seeding. If you're not going to harvest the seeds, especially their grains, make sure that you're terminating your cover crops before they go into seeding because the seeds will now go into the soil and then they will compete with your, your whatever crop you're going to grow, in this case, industrial hemp. So knowing when to terminate and how to incorporate it into the soil, it's very, very important. All right, next slide. Okay, so I was going to talk about um, fiber processing, but I looked at the time because we need, we need to give our, 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 our um, participant time to ask questions and for us to respond. So we'll do cover a whole section on fiber processing for our next um, series. And we actually bring in some um, people from the processing industry to talk to you about the ins and outs of fiber processing. Um, just in general, if you're growing fiber, um, if you're growing fiber for either just fiber or fiber and grain, you have to decide your acreage. And one of the things you have to also know is what are you growing the fiber for? Who is your buyer? Knowing your buyer will now decide, will now help you determine what you're going to process. The first method of processing, this is just basic information um, there's something called retting. Um, retting is basically uh, when your fiber biomass is ready for harvest, you have to cut them down and allow them to temporarily decompose so that you can easily uh, de-herd them, remove the herd. And then the, the inside stem is what is then uh, moved to the next level of processing. And that's where the finer fiber that is then processed for whatever um, uses there are. So depending on the use of fiber, uh, you can go from that redding, which is the initial process, and then you take it to the next um, uh, level, which is called decortication. And this is where the uh, machines would then um, separate the fiber. And if the fiber is for textile industry or for other um, uses, there are different levels of processing, but we'll cover that next time because it, it, I have to cover it in, in details and go through all of the different stages. But um, uh, the good news is that people are just starting to, to, to um, plant their crops now. So the next, our next um, presentation will cover uh, fiber processing, different stages, and how do you get to the place where um, you can get the most bulk out of your fiber. Um, and over here, of course, I have our Mr. Uh, Jason Ergel um, usually shows a picture of the team. So I here is our director. 
um, I'm sorry, our, our VP and Executive Director of uh, uh, 1890 here. This is our team. And then I have next slide. And Dr. Uh, um, Drame, Lemaine Drame, who is the uh, Director for Strategic Initiatives and Evaluation and Engagement. We have uh, Mr. Edo Abidjan and um, the state programs, um, state leader for sustainable agriculture, natural resources and environment, uh, Dr. Um, Joshua Adasi. And these are the people that um, help make things work well and make the life of the researchers like myself um, run smoothly. Next slide. And um, next one. And this is my information as always. Uh, if you have any other question that we did not cover here, um, I have been talking to many of you uh, in the hemp space, uh, the women in, in hemp cultivation. Uh, this is the way to reach me. You can also um, reach the 1890 um, office if you have any questions and they'll be directed to me. Thank you again for listening uh, and I hope you learned something here. Thank you so much, Dr. Noro. Um, so I know we had a few questions um, prior to your presentation. So I am going to jump back on those two questions. But as a reminder, if you do have questions for Dr. Anuro and uh, Mr. Ergel, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. This time is dedicated to, to you all um, to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. So for the cannabinoid uh, varieties, are you using transplants or clones or direct seed planting? And I, Jason, I think this question is directed to, uh, towards you. Um, and then there's a second question. Did you see any difference in yield comparing various um, planting methods? So I have tried both uh, transplants um, as well as direct seeding on, uh, you know, large acreage farms uh, up to 100 acres and uh, anywhere between 20 to 100 acres. Um, did not have a lot of success with the direct seeding. Um, it could have been, you know, due to the soil content, but the, um, the direct figure that I had that we used, um, you know, it was an experiment. Uh, it was tough, so we need to we need to perfect that model. Um, so I'd recommend direct seeding at this time. Um, I also did uh, transplants. That was the uh, the best uh, the best yield that we received. Uh, also, it was cost efficient. From you know, you're not paying for a full clone. We did clones inside of our greenhouse operation, but on a outdoor uh, outdoor you know farm plot you know row crop. We use transplants. Not that's. I think that's my favorite method um, for you know a, a five, ten plus you know acre acre farm. Okay. I was just going to add. Um, was mostly for direct seeding. Um, the fiber, usually fiber, the fiber varieties are the best to do direct seeding because you you, you are planting a whole lot of seeds at one time. And so you don't have to worry about um, starting them prior to that. So the fiber would be um, fiber or fiber grain would be a good um, variety to to go with um, direct seeding. Okay. Are processors still going bankrupt before hemp farmers receive any payments? There are definitely um, still bankruptcies, you know, rocking the, the market there. Um, you know, there's some that have been restructured, but that is still happening in the industry. A lot of those folks that are going bankrupt were companies that overspent on equipment, didn't have enough cash flow left to actually purchase the materials that are needed to go through their you know, particular extraction um, distillation methods. It's still happening. I do think the the price crash and, and you know, sort of the carnage that we experienced in 2019, 2020 has leveled off. Uh, it's not as, as severe as it was, but it, it's, still ha it's still happening in certain parts of the country. Okay. Um, 
Dr. Nuro, you talked about um, cover crops. So does wheat grow well in the low country as an economic cover crop? Well, growing well, um, it would grow well, but then the market side of that, uh, I can't say much about the market side, but I know that wheat, it's in um, huge demand, but you have to know the market. You have to know where to take it to. And maybe, Justin, do you have any any information on, I, I can get that information. We can get it next time, but but there's there's a market for wheat you just have to find out where to take it but either way if you do grow the wheat uh, you're killing two birds or three birds or four birds with one stone that's the way i look at it we used a lot of clover and winter rye in the midlands of, of south carolina when our grows there that seemed to help a lot on the on the working rows as well as the field borders right um, as far as the wheat goes um yeah you'd have to just contact SC State um, to try to get a good source for um, finding those benchmarks and seeing if it's worth the extra labor or, you know, fuel and whatnot to, to harvest that and that you'll get a, a good return um, to make it worthwhile instead of just plowing under. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I will assume this is the last question. Of course, we still, still have about 15 more minutes. So definitely, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, submit your questions through chat feature. Um, are applications still closed to become a grower, or do we still have to wait until 2021? Yes, you have to. Oh, God. I was going to say you have to wait until 2022. The application for 2021 is closed. You have to wait for 2022. Right. right. Those applications usually come out at the beginning of the year. So uh, make sure you get on the uh, South Carolina Department of Agriculture's you know, email list and you can find out when um, when they're gonna release those applications so that you can get all of you know your information in a row um, for 2022. But yes, uh, Dr. Nero is correct. They're closed for this year. Uh, you can still get uh, that's cultivation license. Let me add one little thing. That's cultivation license, uh, licensees. But I believe you still can get, uh, you know, a dealers and handlers license and some other ways that you can participate in the program. Just not cultivation of of crops yourself. That's correct. And also, just for the person who asked the question, uh, it's also good. We're at, we're at in June right now, so it looks like you have a long a long time. Uh, to play with, but this is the time to, if you already have a farm, or if you have a farm, you don't have a farm number, this is the time to visit your FSA office. Make sure that you have your farm number, because that's important. Without that, you're not even going to fill out the application. So make sure you do that. That's a good point, um, Dr. Nuro. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> what are the best performing strains in South Carolina? For industrial hemp? Uh, Aruna, if you can clarify that. Yes, she says yes. Okay. So uh, for purposes of, we, uh, we can't say a particular one is best for South Carolina. Um, but I, I, I know that and, and there, one of the ones that a lot of people talk about is um, cherry blossom. Um, there is um, uh, other types of, um, uh, there's anadi. Um, there's also, um, what is it called? Um, I believe it's, um, trying to remember the variety now. But, box. huh? The box. The box, box, yes, yes, and some of those are are, are good for um, South Carolina, but but that's where the research is not yet set. That's why the research is uh, you can't really say for sure uh, because only one or two um, varieties have been solely um, cultivated here or or produced for cultivation in South Carolina, and this is where the research in the next year or two or three. That would be more information that would say, okay, this list of, 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 of strains or, I mean, clones or cultivars are absolutely good for South Carolina. 
backed by research and data. And, and something to add there is that there's different regions of South Carolina that right. have different soil types, different um, climate, humidities. Um, you know, humidity is something that we deal with a lot down here that other states out west don't deal with as much. So you really want to have, you know, plants that have good spacing uh, and good airflow to keep, you know, mold and mildew from, uh, from you know, attacking the plant. So it, it is kind of a sort of depends on where you are in South Carolina, what type of soil you have and uh, the airflow and, and, and that type of thing. Um, just staying along the same lines of um, talking about strains, um, did you notice any early or premature flowering in certain strains? Some strains would prematurely um, flower, uh, um, particularly, well, it's not necessarily strain related, but, but most times it's environmental factors that can induce um, premature flowering. Um, also, sometimes when you have um, heat stress or uh, um, drought, which is, you know, if you're not watering them enough, those type of stress can, can induce um, uh, flowering. Uh, sometimes also the, the temperature, if you do an indoor growing, for example, and your, your light cycle changes, um, you know, because those plants are, um, they, they are sensitive to uh, day length. So if, if for some reason the day length changes suddenly, they can uh, get confused and go into, into flowering. But, but that's why you also need to make sure that you also have your feminine, uh, your uh, feminine, feminized seeds and know where you're getting your seeds from. Because those, those will eliminate some of those uh, issues as well. When you grow, when you go outside, outdoors, the as Dr. Nero said, the plants are photo um, sensitive. So if you plant later, you know, say, you know, July, you're not going to have as much time for that uh, yield to grow on that plant before the summer solstice um, and the days after the summer solstice triggers that flowering. So it is trying to find a sweet spot of that particular genetic on when to plant it. And so that it will get, get maximum yield before it goes into flower. That way the yield meaning all of the uh, branches are going out. And then when it starts flowering, there's more branches for the buds to uh, grow on. Um, so that's, the, that's, that's what you have to take into account in outdoor. Okay. Uh, let's see another one. What are the prices that you are seeing for flower? That depends on the 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 content of the flower. Um, it, you know, it's sort of a a point. You know, a per point content. So if you've got um, a you know a higher you know CBD or CBG content flower, it'll go for you know a higher amount. Lower CBD CBG content will go for a lower amount. I recommend uh, looking at um, the hemp benchmarks website. Uh, I mentioned I put it on the slide earlier, so you'll be able to have that. That gives you up to, up to the minute um, data on different types of flour, uh, what those prices are. It also includes seed, grain, um, you know, fiber, etc. That's really a good resource to um, to have. That will have more of the knowledge than I do right now. But it's it's a little bit all over the place depending on the region. And and. To also add to that um, is mostly um, your price point, in addition to the factors that um, Jason mentioned, um, your, the way you grew your plant. If you, if you grew your plant purely organic, it's, it's, it's premium crop. And people, you, pay, you get a higher um, price for that versus someone who grew the same amount of flour with conventional um, means. So they're looking for you know organic versus maybe partial organic or non-organic. So all of those factors play into um, how much you get for your crop, for your flower. Sorry. Uh, someone asked that you talk a little bit about hemp seeds for food, using it in salads, smoothies, those kinds of things. All right, so hemp seed is it's one of the um, well right now it's getting grounds, but it's it's as more people find out about how wonderful it is, 
uh, is going to become more popular. But um, um, for hemp seeds, they have a very unique combination of fatty acids, the good, the good oils that are that are heart healthy and good for your skin, your hair, and all of that, which is omega fatty acid three, six, mm -hmm. and nine. So hemp seeds have that. So and when you when you buy them, you they will usually say called hemp seed. That means they remove the husk. And you have the, the whole hand feet. And you can use that in your smoothie. You can you can chew them like any other um, seeds. You can use them in your salad, uh, incorporated in your baking. So those are those are and it's it also has good uh, amount of protein, by the way, in addition to those things. Hmm. Thank you very much. I'm I'm trying to get a little a little healthier. <laughs> yeah. I have some I have recipes. Um, I use that a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so Dwayne Richardson asks, are you aware of investors looking to invest in farms? I don't know any right now off the top of my head investing in, in farms alone. Um, I'm not saying they're not out there. Um, you know, there are, you know, investors out there. Um, there's Art View, which is a, a, a investor group that invests in all different types of the supply chain um, and others. But as far as individual investors investing in a farm, I don't have any off the top of my head. But um, if you contact me separately, I can put you, I can send you the right place to start looking and um, and look for those, those those potentials. And if you have, oh, sorry, I was going to say at 1890 here, uh, if we um, have any connections to potential resources for farmers, um, definitely we share through our um, um, extension agents uh, through Dr. Atassi's office so that um, people can know um, where to look for resources. And one more thing that I have to add, if you are interested in, in um, using those good agricultural practices such as cover crops, there are small um, monies out there that you can actually apply for. Um, even the Biden administration has been touting uh, sustainable agriculture because they want to heal our earth and they want to heal our soil. They want farmers to, to go back to the old days when, when things were, were um, good. So um, there are resources out there, um, Natural Resource Conservation Service. If you look at their website, you might have some little money there to help you with cover crop um, costs. Um, when you are classifying the best strains, when you are classifying the best strains, um, let me see, would be doing that. Would you be doing, would you do that from a medicinal standpoint or just usage? Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Nero. I, you got to work backwards, basically. You know, you, you go to what your end, end product is going to be. Um, so whether that's going to, you're just going to sell biomass or if you're going to try to take it further into an oil, or if you're going to sell fiber, um, you find out what your end product is going to be and work backwards. Um, that's a general general rule. Uh, Dr. Nero may have some more specific advice. Yeah, so... Yeah. And, and what Jason said is true. So if you're interested in um, CBD, then you can now look at CBD varieties and look at the best strength. If you're doing fiber, because you can't cross compare them, so that the the fiber strain, um, you know, varieties or, or strains, then there's fiber and grain. Those are are good for both fiber and grain. But one thing uh, based on uh, information out there, but again, res more research is needed. Those varieties that are the, the varieties of, of uh, industrial hemp that give you fiber and grain as, as well, uh, the fiber qualities are slightly less than the ones that are truly uh, bred or cultivated just for fiber. So those are the kind of things you have to look at. But other people will look at it, I can grow fiber and grain because I'm getting a little bit of that and a little bit of that. So it, it depends on what your uh, your 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 end game is. What are you trying to achieve as, a, as an industrial hemp co um, um, cultivator or farmer? You have to decide what you, what it is that you're, you're interested in. Um. What spacing are you using in South Carolina? 
uh, Dr. Neuro, you may have some more information. It depends on it depends on the genetic that you have, and the end result. You know, if you have a uh, you know a shorter, um, you know, basically wider plants, you know, you'll need to add a little bit more spacing for airflow. If you're growing industrial hemp, you know, you can plant it close together, which Dr. Nero alluded to with the direct seeding model. So it really does depend. I know a lot of these answers are it depends, but it really does depend on, on what uh, what your end goal is. Um, so the spaces are different. I can give you some examples uh, offline of what we use at different times, um, but it's all they're all a little bit different. We've tried multiple genetics and use multiple different spacing. It depends on whether you're using plastic or not. Um, raised beds or not, um, so uh, I, can, I can provide more insight on that, um, you know, after after this presentation. And we cover we covered um, the spacing and uh, row spacing and uh, planting spacing in our previous. I think it was our first webinar. Um, it depends, like he mentioned, depends on the variety. For CBD in general, you need more spacing because they tend to bush out in a rosette format. Um, and so you need that space to allow them to bush up because the bushier they are, the more flower heads you get. So if you plant them too close, then they tend to kind of grow upwards and you will not get maximum uh, flower heads. Um, so it, it depends on um, the variety and then the farmers. Some farmers will like to maximize their farmland. If you have one or two acres, you want to like, put a lot as much as you want in there. Um, but farmers who have a lot of acreage and can play with spacing, uh, I've seen farmers do a, even um, uh, three feet to four feet in between the plants for CBD. And, and so to allow them time, uh, but you can plant closer, you can plant um, 18 inches, um, 24 inches. Again, it depends on how much, how much farmland you have and what your ultimate goal is. But for fiber, as as um, Jason alluded to, fiber needs they needs to be uh, planted very closely because it makes them to stretch out, and it actually produces a fiber uh, better fiber quality. And make sure, if depending on the size of your outdoor farm, to leave a working row. We leave working rows so you can get in there to you know add fertilizer, um, propagate, etc. Um, and um, there is on the last presentation we did. There is some specific recommendations that I experienced uh, in the PD area of the state on spacing with a um, Victoria genetic as well as Bach genetic, and there were different there were different spacings for each different genetic, and that that can be found on the, on the last last um, time presentation. Awesome. Did you notice sex changes in plants, male becoming females? I've definitely seen some uh, some hermaphrodite um, plants. Um, you know, when you're not, you know, using a a fully, um, you know, processed seed, for lack of a better word, a processed genetic. Um, there's still some variation in the cultivar. Um, I've definitely seen some plants go um, to her hermaphrodite that have both male and female um, qualities. Um, changing all the way from from female to male, I've not seen that. What areas in South Carolina would be ideal to grow hemp? I, I think in general, you can grow hemp in, in any of the areas, but you have to um, check your soil. I know it's in low lying areas where there's, um, the soil is cut on the soggy side or muddy side. Industrial hemp doesn't do well on that. So you have to look at your soil type, which is very, very important. You want to make sure that your soil does not retain a lot of water and uh, it's not compact because those two things would um, slow uh, the uh, growth of the industrial hemp. And that means you're going to be fertilizing a lot and it might even cause some stress and, and shoot up your THC level, which is what you don't want. You want to minimize as much stress as possible while you're growing uh, so that your the, the THC and CBD ratio, it's it's um, inverse. That means you want a higher CBD uh, content and as low as the THC um, content or concentration in your in your end product. And you get more money for that. The lower your THC and the higher your CBD, the more money you get for your for your uh, biomass, your flowers or your oils. 
something to consider that I, I unfortunately went through was, you know, the coastal plain, um, the harvest season uh, is right in the middle, outdoor harvest season is right in the middle of, of hurricane season. So just be, be aware that if you're planting on the coastal plain, the salinity level as well as uh, hurricane wind damage uh, can affect your crop, which I've, I've learned the hard way. I'm um, just not saying you can't plant there. I'm just saying something to be wary of and, and making sure that you might have mitigation insurance, um, et cetera, to mitigate any risk there. What type of hemp would you use for microgreens and hemp hearts? Microgreens. Okay. Um, by the virtue of the name, hemp and microgreen, it's um, not sure. Now, unless I, I don't think you would lump hemp into the microgreen space, as far as I know. But um, for hemp hearts, of course, you would be growing the fiber variety. And the, fi the, fi the fiber variety, as I mentioned, uh, there's a grain variety that you grow just specifically to harvest the seeds at the end, um, you can then do something with the fiber. Those are the, that's what you will grow if you're looking for, if you're into the grains and the neutral, the, the nutraceuticals. So that's, that's, um, that's what you're growing for. The CBDs, yeah. the CBD varieties, you do not grow them for the seeds because you don't want them to go to, to seeds, otherwise it defeats the whole purpose. So the grain variety, the, the fiber variety is your, is your choice for grains. I was just going to add real quick for microgreens, you know, obviously those are being used in restaurants for you know, tr nutritional purposes. So testing the nutritional content of, of those genetics um, before you buy a lot of them would be the best way to go there. Obviously, some folks want a little bit of CBD in there, but when you're growing such a small amount or a small life cycle, that CBD is not going to fully flesh out. So I would be looking um, for the nutritional content, maybe more than the CBD content. And you probably need to do that through testing and, and searching around. Right. All right. Well, I think that was our last question for uh, today. Um, I want to thank, of course, Dr. Anuro and uh, Mr. Jason Ergel for taking time again to share with our interested um, small and minority farmers about um, the industrial hemp space. Uh, we know that this is an emerging crop in South Carolina and there are a lot of unanswered questions and people just trying to figure out uh, how best they can enter into the market. So uh, we definitely thank you all for taking the time to put this together and working together and sharing what, what you know um, about uh, hemp. And um, I, I invite you all to kind of stick around for maybe another three to four minutes. We'd love to show you a video that we recently produced about our work with um, Bright Moth Farms, uh, which is a farm in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, um, that's doing some industrial hemp work in um, greenhouse. And um, we are, Dr. Nuro is partnering with them and um, they are, they have begun to conduct um, trials on um, grain, CBD and, and fiber. And so we recently made a delivery um, to our uh, 1890s small farm partner in, is that Bowman or Bamberg, Bowman, South Carolina? Bowman. Bowman, Bowman yeah. So um, if you have, two or three minutes, take a look at our, our video. Um, it just gives you a little bit more information, again, about the work that we're doing through hemp. Um, we thank you so much for joining us. We will provide you with the presentation decks um, at the conclusion of this presentation or of this webinar. And um, you will receive it to the email address to, that you use to register for this event. And um, I hope you will stay attuned to your emails because we will be sending out the next uh, webinar, uh, I think it's session four. So thank you again.